100 years ago, Albert Einstein taught us that space and time are warped by the mass and the energy that live in our universe. And he gave us the physical law that governs that warping, his Einstein field equation. Uh, sorry. Um, just uh, 10 years ago, Linda Opes and I conceived a movie that would explain to the world Einstein's ideas, and she brought Christopher Nolan and Jonathan Nolan on board to write the screenplay and to direct the movie. In the hands of the Nolans, this became the movie Interstellar. They changed our story so much that it is hardly our movie at all. It really belongs to the Nolans. But in the process, they worked closely with me to preserve the science that Linda and I had created for the movie and to brainstorm to insert new science so that this movie, Interstellar, has more rich science in it, real science, than any other movie that has ever been made in Hollywood. They also added to the movie a theme which explains what's the point of Interstellar. The point is the enormous power of science and technology to save humanity from disaster. In our real world, in fact, we need science and technology to save us from the disaster, the future disaster of climate change, the disaster of rapidly evolving pathogens that uh, can kill us or kill the plants that we survive on, as happens in the movie Interstellar, and for other unknown future threats that uh, will occur inevitably over the coming decades and centuries. Now, uh, one of the great things about Christopher Nolan's movie Interstellar is that you go to the movie and you come out not understanding. You puzzle, you wonder about it, particularly the, the amazing climax uh, where Cooper is behind his daughter's uh, bedroom, behind the bookshelves. And uh, you puzzle about it so much that you go back to see it a second time, maybe a third time, a fourth time, and you still don't fully understand. And it sells a lot of tickets, 100 million tickets worldwide that way. Uh, and so I've written a book called The Science of Interstellar to explain things. Christopher Nolan said to me that he wanted to have an ending, that it was as puzzling as the ending of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and it is. But then he said, it's your job, Kip, to explain to the world what that ending is. And so I explain it in my book, and I suggest that you get the Blu-ray or the CD, you get my book, you go back and forth between the two of them, and you really figure out in your mind what's going on. But I'll try to help you in the next few minutes by talking about the story of the movie from the point of view of the science. Now, the science, some of the science is very solid science. It is truth. Other of the science is speculation. It is in a realm where we do not yet fully understand the laws of physics, particularly the laws of quantum gravity or wormholes. And for each piece of science in the movie, for each slide, I will put a, small, a little T or an S in the upper right-hand corner of the slide so you know, is this truth or this, is this speculation? Now, the movie begins in an era when there has been a great ecological and biological disaster on Earth. Billions of people have died. There are only a few million people left on Earth. And it is becoming increasingly clear that humanity must leave the Earth in order to survive. But there are no other planets in our solar system that can be lived on. And the nearest planet that probably can be lived on is around the star Tau Ceti, uh, that's 12 light years from Earth. That's so far that with uh, human technology, it's impossible to reach there. We need technology of several centuries into the future. Fortunately, at, at the beginning of the movie, an alien civilization, an advanced civilization called Vault Beings, has put uh, into the uh, vicinity of Saturn, where we can reach it, a wormhole mouth. Now, let me explain wormholes then. Our universe has three dimensions, and it is embedded in a higher, uh, larger space that is called the bulk by physicists, which has one more spatial dimension, four spatial dimensions. Uh, I'm removing one dimension from this diagram so that you can uh, visualize it. So I, it looks like our universe has two dimensions and the bulk has three. Now, let's imagine that our universe 
is bent down in the bulk under itself like this. So the distance between uh, Saturn and the center of an alien galaxy is just one kilometer. But nothing in our universe can cross over that one kilometer of bulk unless there has been built somehow an appendage to our universe that reaches upward from, uh, or downward from the vicinity of Saturn to the vicinity of the alien galaxy. That appendage is the wormhole, and light traveling through that wormhole uh, from the alien galaxy up to Saturn brings us the image that we see of the wormhole mouth. Uh, that wormhole mouth then looks like a crystal ball inside of which you see the stars and the nebulae of the alien galaxy. Now, do the laws of physics really allow wormholes to exist? We don't know. I suspect not, but I've worked hard and my colleagues have worked hard to prove it's impossible. We've worked for decades and we have not proved it's impossible, so maybe, maybe they can exist. And in the movie Interstellar, they do exist. And so, in Interstellar, then, Cooper, the hero, travels through a wormhole into the alien galaxy. And this is a film clip produced just for this lecture and a few other lectures I'm giving that shows precisely how that trip would look with the wormhole that you see in Interstellar. The trip in the movie is a little different because the artists have added some, ex added some excitement to it. It's the only place that the science has been distorted in that film. I'll show you the real trip. So you're headed down into the wormhole, through the wormhole, now you're in the alien galaxy, and now you understand why they had to add some excitement for the movie. Uh, that's, this is the way it really would go, and it's not that big a deal. Now, in, on the other side of the alien galaxy is a habitable planet, it appears. It has a lot of water. Water is essential for human life. It's called Miller's planet. But Miller's planet is in orbit around a black hole called Gargantua. Now, this image of the black hole is very different from any image you've ever seen in a Hollywood movie or a TV show uh, before Interstellar. This is the way it would really would work. We know because this image was produced by solving Einstein's equations in a simulation where I provided the equations, the mathematics, and a team in London uh, did the simulations. So why does it look like that? It's because light from the back, upper back face of this disk uh, travels upward and is pulled down to the camera by the black hole's strong gravity, causing the upper face of the disk to look like it's wrapped up above the black hole. Similarly, the bottom face of the disk looks like it's wrapped under the black hole, and the piece of the disk directly in front of uh, the camera, the light goes directly to the camera, and so it just looks like it's right where it is. And so that's the reason the image is of this sort. Now, very important for this movie is Einstein's law of time warps, which says that things like to live where they will age the most slowly, and gravity pulls them there. Uh, the Earth's mass warps time, and this time warps pr produces gravity, and this has been tested with high precision on the surface of the Earth. Near the black hole Gargantua, gravity is enormously stronger, so the slowing of time is enormously greater. One hour on Miller's planet is seven years on Earth, which gives rise to a great emotion in the movie uh, when Cooper begins with his daughter, who is only 10 years old. He goes near Gargantua. His daughter grows up to become a great theoretical physicist. And then he goes near Gargantua again, and his daughter ages to become very old. Now, crucial to the movie is not only finding a habitable planet, but lifting humanity off of that Earth in large cylindrical uh, space colonies in order that they be able to travel to that planet. But the problem is that rockets on Earth are much too weak to do the job. And so, Berf and her mentor, Professor Brand, work hard to figure out how to turn down the gravity of the Earth in order to lift off uh, the colonies. And uh, they figure this out on the basis of gravitational anomalies. When dust falls in Murph's bedroom, when she's very young, it lands in thin strips across the floor. And the, uh, then when Cooper, throw, throw, when Cooper throws a coin, it winds up sitting on the floor right on top of the thin strip. And this always happens, and so he figures out 
that gravity is stronger in the thin strips and weaker in between, gravity has been modified. And so Brand realizes if she can figure out, together with Professor, Professor Brand and, and Murph, if they can figure out how to control these anomalies, they may be able thereby to uh, lift, to turn gravity down on the surface of the Earth so that the rockets can be li lift the colonies up into space uh, with their puny rocket power. Half of the answer then for how to do that is in the equations they have on their blackboards. The other half, they think, is inside the black hole Gargantua. And so Cooper goes into the black hole, which looks like this from the point of view of the, of the bulk beings looking at the black hole. He goes down through the event horizon of the black hole, the point of no return beyond which nothing can get out. And here we watch his trip. Approaching the event horizon. Forward side, dipping down beneath it. They go through it. It's quite, it's quite amazing. If you look there, you can see above him. He's inside the black hole, but you can see out, and you can see the universe and the accretion disk around Gargantua. Light can come into Cooper, even though he cannot send light out. Inside Gargantua, there is a singularity, a chaotic singularity, which is governed by the laws of quantum gravity, which we do not understand very well. This is the other half of the information that's needed to control the gravitational anomalies. If Cooper were to go in the, there, however, he would die. But fortunately, there are two other singularities that are much more gentle inside the black hole. And Cooper is caught by one, a so-called outgoing singularity. He's picked up by a tesseract which has been placed there by the bulk beings uh, to carry him back through the universe, uh, uh, through the bulk, back to Earth. Now, the distance across our universe is just 10 billion light years, but the distance through the bulk is a much shorter distance, and so he's able to make the trip very quickly. Back on Earth, the Tesseract docks alongside Murph's bedroom. The Tesseract has one face, which is a cube, this tesseract is a four-dimensional cube. This is an ordinary cube in which Cooper floats. Murph is in the other face. Her bedroom is in the other face of the tesseract when it is docked. And light from uh, Murph goes to Cooper's eyes, and he can therefore see uh, Murph in all directions he looks. He looks up, he sees Murph, the top of Murph's head. He looks to the side, he sees Murph from the side. So to him, what it looks like is that he is surrounded by six different bedrooms all identical with Murph inside them. This is a picture of that from uh, Interstellar, and here we see a film clip. Uh, Cooper has just arrived, and he's very confused, and you see multiple images of her bedroom. This is the climax, the puzzling climax of the film, and the key to this climax is that Cooper and Murph are on opposite faces of a four-dimensional cube. Cooper sends the quantum data that he has gotten from inside the black hole to Murph by pushing on a plate that sends a gravitational force through the interior of the Tesseract, which is a piece of four-dimensional space, to Murph. That makes the second hand on a watch move back and forth in a pattern that conveys the information that Murph needs in order to lift uh, humanity off of the Earth. Uh, but the strange thing is that Cooper has now made two trips to near the black hole, and so his Murph is now very old when he transmits the data, but she receives it when she is a young woman, a theoretical physicist. So it has somehow gone backward in time. And how it did that is very weird. The gravitational signal that goes from Cooper to Murph traveling through the interior four-dimensional space of the Tesseract, it goes forward in time as measured inside the Tesseract, but backward in time as measured on the Earth. And I describe how that's possible in my book, The Science of Interstellar. The climax is, of course, that Murph is able to uh, take those data figure out how to lift humanity off the Earth by turning down uh, the Earth's gravity 
and save humanity. And the final point then of interstellar is that whether the science and technology come from the bulk beings who certainly hurt, helped Cooper and Murph all the way along, or whether it comes from Cooper and Murph themselves, and much of it does come from them themselves, the key to their success is the enormous power of science and technology.